Thanks for hanging in there, guys. For the past few months, I've been spending most of my time and attention with Gimme Radio's Metal Matters podcast. I appreciate everyone from Everything Went Black that's jumped over and checked out what we're doing over at Metal Matters. So we're back with a new mission statement. I'd like to welcome everyone to the debut episode of Night Talk, a new series I'm going to be releasing on Everything Went Black. It'll be focusing on the occult, paranormal, and esoteric topics. For longtime listeners of the show, these aren't necessarily new topics, but in the coming months, they'll become more of a focus on what we're going to be talking about. For this debut episode, I'd like to welcome Tom Holzer and Barry Pirro, two tri-state area-based paranormal investigators. Barry has been studying the paranormal for over a decade. He has contributed material and served as a consultant for TV shows Paranormal Survivor, A Haunting, and the Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures. His partner, Tom Holzer, contributes the quantitative aspect to the efforts, employing measurement, audio and video techniques, and a decidedly scientific approach. Together, they seek to provide understanding and guidance to their clients. You can go to their website for more information audio clips, case files, and contact. And that is ConnecticutGhostHunter.com. Before we get started, it's going to give you the basic stuff. Please leave ratings on iTunes, like us on Facebook, Everything Went Black. That's our Facebook page. And you can follow me on Instagram as Michael underscore DC underscore Hill. How did you guys meet over the, you know, you are paranormal investigators, so how did you actually come in contact with each other? Well, actually, uh, it started where uh, I went to the library over in uh, Mount Kisco here and was picking up some books and saw a flyer that said Barry Pirro, a paranormal investigator, giving a lecture uh, on such and such date. Um, and I think it was actually my wife who pushed me to go uh, to the lecture because I, I'm very fascinated in general. I've been very fascinated for a long time with paranormal experiences. Um, so... I go to uh, his lecture, are very fascinating, and afterward I stay and I start talking to Barry about other paranormal groups or anybody who does uh, try and apply a scientific method um, to these investigations, and I started explaining some uh, a couple of hypotheses that I had, and um, after talking with Barry, he said, hey, if you want to come check it out, uh, come along, and uh, I guess it's almost like a marriage we've been together ever since. How many years ago was that? <laughs> Uh, was that three years ago, four years ago? Yeah. Okay. Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you, had you had um, any experiences prior to that, like, you know, that drew, drew you into being interested in the paranormal? Yeah. In general, I've always been fascinated with the things I, I don't understand. Um, but I did have one specific experience about 10 years ago uh, when I was staying in New Orleans for about two weeks. Um, I was in the French Quarter over on Dolphin Street, I believe. Uh, anyway, I was uh, crashing with uh, with this woman who uh, who was basically letting me stay uh, because we were working on a film shoot. Uh, she was a location manager. Um, so one night, I basically went outside onto the balcony and I started hearing some uh, some people talking on the inside of the apartment. Um, it's kind of like you can you can hear their uh, hear somebody that, like talking, but you can't hear what they're saying, sort of thing. Um, so I didn't want to be rude, so I stood up and I turned around because I didn't want to be like, oh, the rude guest who is just sure. like being being outside. Uh, so I stood up, turned around to go inside to introduce myself, and I saw this uh, probably 12, 13-year-old girl uh, standing behind her couch uh, looking towards uh, one of the walls in the room. And I was just very confused. Um, I had no idea who she was, why she was standing there. She had long black hair. She was wearing uh, like a white nightgown. Um, so I'm standing there cause, and staring at her because this just doesn't make any sense at all. And all of a sudden she just disappears. Like I didn't look away or anything like that. I was, I was staring right at her and she just vanishes. So I'm very confused at this point. <laughs> I so you, have, you knew something was going on, but you just Something was sure wrong. Was, um, yeah. I wasn't, you know, hadn't used any heavy narcotics, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, some, something was definitely going on there. I just wasn't sure what it was. And I wasn't about to go to this woman and say, hey, do you have a ghost? Um, so what I did is I went up to her and I said, hey, did you have uh, any guests come over um, in the past couple of minutes by any chance? And she's like, no, why? And I said, uh, well, I think I saw something on Matra. And she cut me off and she said, you saw the little girl. 
And oh. I said, what? <laughs> okay. And she's like, yeah, I've never seen her, but uh, some people have come over and they said they've, they've seen her. Um, and um, she just kind of hangs out kind of like a roommate. Um, that's, that's how it was kind of perceived. And I didn't have any negative issues with it. I, like there was, there's nothing bad that happened. Um, but it definitely, that was a huge spark for me. And in the paranormal uh, society, that's actually a very rare thing to, to happen. Um, most people don't ever have that happen to them. Um, but yeah. Barry. <laughs> Well, my experience, <laughs> um, I grew up in a haunted house, which is always the best way to start, <laughs> you know, any, <laughs> anything like this. Um, I grew up in Tarrytown, New York, and the house was new. I mean, we moved in, uh, it had just been built in the 70s, 73, I think. Um, but things used to happen in that house. Um, you know, uh, the lights used to go on and off by themselves. The creepiest thing that happened, and that's the one that I always tell in my lectures, is the piano used to play by itself at night. And everybody in the family heard it, not just me. My brother and I heard it. We would knock. We had an adjoining adjoining bedrooms, and he would knock on the wall when he heard it, and then he'd come running into my room, and we would sit on the bed and listen to the piano playing at night. Um, and it would play the same thing every time. It would go boom, 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 ba da 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 da. Play this little tune over and over again. Um, my parents heard it. Um, I used to see a little like dog run by. Um, a man was seen standing in the yard once. Uh, my my sister saw that. Uh, my mom saw somebody, a man, uh, standing in her doorway of her bedroom once. And um, different things happened in that house. So that really, that's how I really got my interest in this. And then from there, you started you know studying it or from there i leapt until i was an adult <laughs> and i uh well i've always been interested so i read all of the um the ghost books that were available at the okay. time that the hans holzer no no relation no right relation. <laughs> no relation no relation um all those books and that you know that was great for me i loved those stories <clears throat> and it was something i was just always really interested in um and then much later um i met a paranormal group and i joined that group and that's how I really got started. So how would you define like having a paranormal experience? Like what, like some of these definitions, um, you know, seeing things, having sort of a collective experience with other people, in your case, the family members, like what, when someone approaches you and says, I'm ha I, I live in a haunted house or I, I'm having these experiences, I think I'm seeing, experiencing entities in my, in my home. What does that actually mean? Like, what is, the, what is the, the sort of base definition of all these things? Well, that's what you're trying to figure out. Um, I send out a, a uh, questionnaire, and I really just want to know yes, no answers as much as possible because I'm intuitive, and when I go to the house, I kind of want to walk around and say I'm feeling something in this room, and they will confirm that. I'll pick up names. I'll pick up different information. Um, if there's not enough for, for, you know, for me to go on and for me to say, yeah, I, I'll come and do an investigation, and then I just turn it down. Um, but really, you're looking for, for um, activity that's consistently, you know, going on for a long time, that more than one person are seeing it. It's not just a feeling people have. Some people are creeped out in their basement, and I'm like, well, a lot of people are creeped out in their basement. Yeah. Um, you know, basements are creepy. They There's are. a reason. Um, but, you know, if people are actually seeing things or hearing things or experiencing things, various family members are seeing the same things. Um, I love visual stories of visual sightings of ghosts. That's my favorite. You know, if somebody sees someone. Um, there's a lot of the typical footsteps in the night and things like that. And those are those are pretty typical. I mean, they really are. That's like something that a lot of people uh, report. That actually, remind, that actually reminded me of a Zillow listing that I saw, uh, a Zillow, the um, real estate website. Uh, it was listing for a house uh, in Ohio a couple of years ago. And in the description, it literally said, and I, I'm not kidding, it said, um, uh, occasionally you'll hear at 2 a.m. on Wednesdays uh, some light screaming, but you'll get used to it. Some light screaming. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to, that just reminded me of it. Yeah, a friend of mine recently, just over the winter, I stayed at a friend's house in Arlington, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, he was telling me, he's like, you know, the house is haunted. You know, my, my daughter in her room, they've had, she's experienced, you know, she's seen things, things like that. 
And he even went as far as to say when they moved in, it was almost like out of a Stephen King novel where like the guy who came to turn the gas on was like, oh, what'd they tell you about the the old, uh, you know, <laughs> Niles household? It's like, how long have you been living here? You know, that kind of thing. And, and it was like almost out of a novel. But uh, then the one night I stayed there, I, I didn't have any any experiences. But uh, but he's told me some very vivid stories about um, his, his younger daughter, his daughter having, uh, having seen things heard things like that sort of stuff so yeah what's really interesting about all of this is that it's so fairly common i mean really it's fairly common i give a lot of lectures and at the end it's like um you know aa meeting for people who want to admit that they've seen a ghost people stand up and say well you know let me tell my story and they they tell their stories and um everybody either knows someone who has seen a ghost or has a ghost story or they've had them themselves uh, there's just so, 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 so many people that have had these experiences. Okay, so now, how do you, what's, what sort of methodology you do? Once, once you have a case that you agree there might be some sort of activity, okay? What are, what are the methods and, that you would employ to figure out like, what's actually going on? Well, again, I, you know, I send out that questionnaire, and if it looks good enough, mm-hmm. if it looks like it's worth um, doing, I'll set up a time to have, a, you know, to have an investigation and go over and go in person. Um, again, I, I like to not have too much information. I want to know something's happening. Uh, people usually are dying to tell their stories, so yeah, sometimes they tell me too much. Yeah. Um, and then we go over, and um, Tom will tell his you know his part in the investigation uh, which is more of the the scientific part but i do a walk through and that's where i'm trying to pick up intuitive information and i'm saying what i'm feeling at the time i'm saying something's in this room i'm feeling something really creepy in this room um nothing much in you know the living room but in the hallway outside this room and nine times out of ten i'm correct about that information and that's important for me to get that um, I don't want to just go in and say, yeah, I believe everything you tell me. I don't doubt what people tell me. Right. Uh, but yeah. I do. Uh, paranormal investigating is really about firsthand experiences. I tell people that come to the lectures that if you're interested in this, it's one thing to hear about it. It's another thing to actually be in a haunted house and know what I mean when you when I'm saying that, you know, you will actually feel something in a room. You'll feel a presence in a room. Um, so that's that's what I do. And I'm a little country. Uh, (laughs) So uh, basically what I do is I try my best to apply uh, the scientific method to um, investigations. The the biggest challenge that I have, though, um, the biggest challenge that I have is that to actually apply uh, a scientific method of uh, experimenting is extremely difficult in a field like this. so I do my best to have logical conclusions, but I can't replicate um, each investigation a hundred times and test it and then get my average or anything like that. It's just, it's realistically just not uh, going to happen. Um, but what I do try and do is I take uh, readings throughout the house, which include um, humidity, barometric pressure, uh, temperature. Um, I also do EMF readings, and these are not necessarily, I, I don't, do this to try and find a ghost, if you will. What I do is I try and get find a baseline as to what's going on in the house. Um, for example, if somebody's saying uh, this this room is always cold or something something like that, well, one of my meters I would put it in the room and then get a baseline reading on that. Maybe there's an actual draft in the room. Maybe there's something logical that you can explain. And I, I do want to say that uh, every time we go on an investigation, I do believe all these people are having experiences, but it's our job to kind of figure out if we can logistically explain what's happening um, uh, or if we believe it's actually a paranormal experience that is not so uh, straightforward. Well, one of the things, um, we, just, we, we, we touched on this earlier, earlier in a different conversation we had about experiences, like the term all right, experience you can have a paranormal experience, but there can also be a reaction to some other sort of, uh, you know, physical uh, impulse. Yeah. Like if you're living in an area that has high EMF or something like that. Yeah. So um, we actually had a case that was specifically like this, um, where once again, everybody I generally believe was they were experiencing uh, things that they couldn't explain. 
Um, I think this was a second time that we went, uh, first time for me, I think it might've been a second time for Barry. Um, but basically, uh, people were, um, seeing apparitions and things were, were happening in the house. But, um, in our experience, one thing that we found is that nothing is a hundred percent paranormal. Nothing is a hundred percent not paranormal in an actual paranormal situation. There's a blend. So even if you think there may be some sort of haunting in there, it's it's very important to filter out what's what like I said what can actually be explained. So sure. in this scenario, um, people uh, the homeowners were saying how uh, people would sleep in this bed and they would pretty much have nightmares all the time and they they were very like uncomfortable and it just it was a bad feeling. And Barry pointed to me and he said, "Hey, look outside the window." And I looked, and the power line, the main power line for the house, was running right into the junction box, right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, okay. right by the head of the bed. So I'm like, okay. Um, I take out my EMF, which is basically reading an electromagnetic field, which is a byproduct of uh, electricity. Um, and I take a reading, and it's it's a unit of measurement. And uh, I, I read it in milligauss, which it's just a unit of measurement. It's like inches, feet, milligauss. It's just that's how it's measured. Um, so from some of the readings that I've I've looked at. Um, it's believed between 15 to 20 milligauss people will, if they're constantly exposed to it people will start to possibly have nightmares or feel uncomfortable or feel eerie or things like that so i took a reading by the head of the bed and it was something like 17 milligauss because of that main power line coming in so they were probably actually having nightmares and it was probably because the main power line of the house was like four feet away from their head um so the recommendation was don't put your head there yeah. <laughs> pretty much sure. yeah. um so that that's so, going to have been explained by like physical you know some physical impulse. yeah that that was not in my uh opinion it was not uh that specific scenario was not a paranormal experience it was something that was physically happening from man-made things right so but then there's the other type of experience <laughs> then that's where i step in um <laughs> Well, I am actually, you know, I, Tom's more scientific than I am, but I am, I, I'm not skeptical when I go in. Um, I always talk about the, the, the investigation, the investigator part of being a paranormal investigator. You really are an investigator just like a policeman, you know, or like a detective. And I ask a lot of questions, you know. Um, it's funny, when I listen back, I like grill people, like, where did you see it? How far away from, how, from, how far away were you? You know, how long did it last? Did it look solid? What were they wearing? I mean, I'm asking tons of questions because if you don't, you miss a lot. And there's a lot of things that people don't tell you. Well, we did an investigation in Danbury, Connecticut. Tom and I were did this one. And I remember the woman said that she saw a man and he had a plaid shirt and she was very specific. And I said, where'd you see him? She said he was outside in the window and he was looking in. And I said, well, you know, that window is like, you know, pretty high off the ground. That guy would have to have been about... 11 feet tall, um, you know, describe where did you see him exactly? Said, well, I didn't exactly see him. I kind of felt like he was looking in and I got an impression of a man. I was like, all oh, right, well, that's very, yeah. very yeah. different than seeing somebody. Um, you know, the stories where people are, are uh, corroborating stories between a husband and a wife or, you know, various family members, those are really, really interesting. Also, I forgot to mention, I um, carry a digital recorder with me the whole time and I record from the second we get in uh, until we leave and I listen back for um, EVP which is electronic voice phenomenon and that's the ghost voices that you see on the TV shows um, I've picked up tons of those um, really interesting one recently in Brooklyn that was that was one of my favorites I've actually, actually. heard that one have yeah. you heard that oh, one yeah. yeah yeah that was really pretty damn cool that was really cool I mean and the website too has a bunch of that stuff on there too. yeah well I've been yeah. doing this for over a dozen years so I've I've got tons of them um you know I I do brag that mine are better than the TV shows because I listen <laughs> to the TV shows and I'm like they say like you're here like ah. And they're like, oh, it's saying, you know, I, I'm your mother and I'm here. And I'm like, I don't know what that's saying. Uh, mine are real voices. Mine are real, like a person is in the room voices. A lot of them are. Um, so uh, it, it is a lot of work, though, listening back to those recordings and going over the evidence, which is also photo evidence. 
Um, we take photos while we're there. And then, as Tom mentioned, he has all of his meters and things that he's got to go back and pour over those. Um, we did have an interesting thing in another investigation in Danbury. Tom could tell you about that, where a woman, um, it was an interesting case. They were seeing black figures in the house. Um, this woman in particular had, had all these experiences in the house. Um, and while we were there, she said she was beginning to feel cold and I had a thermometer. What is that thermometer called? The, the, it's the, uh, laser the laser thermometer. And the room did start to get cold. And um, Tom looked back at his readings. and Yeah, this, this case actually was kind of uh, the changing point for what I was doing with Barry in the sense of uh, collecting data and information. Because uh, up until this point, I was really just kind of blindly trying to get baselines, not knowing what I was going to get other than, hey, everything looks normal in your house. <laughs> um, and what had happened was um, it was uh, Barry and this woman were in a bedroom uh, on the second floor of the house. I was in another bedroom on the opposing side of the house, which I was only 15, 20 feet away, something like that. Uh, and I also had a digital meter in her room and I had a digital uh, meter for uh, data logging in uh, the room I was in. Um, so right at, during uh, the EVP session that we were doing, the, uh, the woman basically screamed out saying something just grabbed her arm. Um, and we did a quick reading on her arm and it was, it was like 10 degrees cooler than like the rest of her body. Hmm. And so that kind of got me thinking. I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's going on here? Um, and so what ended up happening is, as I'm looking over my data, trying to figure out what's going on and there's, there's fluctuate fluctuations in what I'm looking at, um, uh, because sometimes like doors are opening and closing and people are moving. So that's, that sort of stuff that, um, I anticipate seeing that's like a normal reading. Um, this was not a normal reading because what ended up happening is that about, uh, I want to say 20 minutes before, uh, she screamed out saying her arm was grabbed. The room started dropping um, in temperature and it over a 20 minute period it dropped about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is a lot. a lot actually. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's a lot, especially considering the fact that uh, it was in the evening. Um, that room was actually facing north uh, and we're in the northern hemisphere. So the room I was in should have been more affected by temperature fluctuations. Mm -hmm. The windows were closed. Uh, the homeowners that said they actually just recently insulated that uh, room, uh, actually the, the whole house, if I remember correctly. Um, and I did take readings of uh, the walls that seemed fairly neutral. There was not anything uh, temperature wise. Uh, so the that, actual so, surface of the wall seemed neutral, but the the atmosphere, like the, the atmosphere itself actually dropped. The ambient so, temperature of the, yeah. of the so, okay. so there wasn't any signs of drafts. There wasn't any signs right. of uh, cold contacts on any walls. Uh, there was no air conditioning. Um, they didn't have central air. Um, and like I said, the window was closed. So what had happened is that we had this two and a half degree drop uh, over the 20 minute period, but right when it stopped and I actually have, um, the, uh, what was it a timestamp on my data? So I mm -hmm. know, um, uh, based on atomic time, I know when, what happens and when it happens. Um, right when it leveled off was right at the same time that she said something grabbed my arm and the room just stayed at that temperature. So from that point forward, I started looking because it, it's kind of subtle. A two and a half degree drop is subtle when you're looking at a, a bunch of data, <laughs> like things going up and yeah. down. Uh, but it was it was almost like a signature um, that it seemed to, to be uh, going on there. So and a couple other cases after that, I started to notice in certain areas, especially where people were saying they were having paranormal experiences, this two and a half degree drop uh, over a 20 minute period um, that, and I have to be honest, it didn't necessarily correlate to a paranormal experience that was occurring while we were there. Mm -hmm. um, but I did find it, 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 it wasn't like, oh, this is evidence of like, this is what ghosts are doing and like, this is what's yeah. actually happening. But it just... I started to see correlations and now these are the things that I'm starting to really pay attention to. Now from case to case, like if you take like the, you know, the bird's eye view of all this data, mm -hmm. like phenomena like that seem to be, you know, coincide with other experiences, right? It, there, there seems to be a relationship between that and people, re, um, reporting experiences in that same area. Okay. Um, I haven't collected uh, nearly enough data to make any real claim or correlation, to be honest with you. Um, but it, it's something that I 
really pay attention to and I look for that signature now, if you will, right? Because uh, it is really kind of unique. Um, and I, I have to say that room, the the first time I saw it, that room was very level um, the entire time. I and mean, I could probably pull up the data spreadsheet and bore everybody to the death if they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that room was very, very level, uh, and it wasn't really fluctuating. Um, it fluctuated a little bit when uh, everybody entered. Um, nothing that I would consider abnormal. But that drop was really like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, two degrees is actually quite a bit of temperature drop, sensible you know, temperature. I yeah. Mean, it, it just from like an engineering standpoint, that's like a pretty big... Okay, if there, was a, if there was a drop in temperature, if you were like looking at like a building management system or something like that, that would yeah. indicate that something happened to the physical system. Yeah. There's, so there's that is significant. Possible right? failure. Yeah, <laughs> failure of like a, you know, something. Um, so yeah, it's... When you're taking these measurements, that, that is actually a pretty big drop. Um, the overall scheme of it, though, it's uh, most people would interpret that as something pretty subtle. Um, and that's where another challenge comes in for what I'm doing and what Barry's doing is a lot of this stuff is actually subtle. It's not like the horror movies where like, yeah. ghosts are flying out of uh, you know cabinets and like dishes are getting thrown at us. It's There's a lot of like subtle nuances to what's going on. So now that we kind of got a little bit of overview of everything, you know, Barry does the sort of more qualitative part of the investigation, like the questions, uh, building a narrative, building the storyline of like the people involved. And you've been doing the the technical data points, quantitative aspects of it. So what kind of conclusions, um, you know, with with the actual cases that you've determined are paranormal? Like how, how would you arrive at that conclusion? Um, well, you know, there's so much to the investigation itself besides the interviewing people and then it's you know all the intuitive stuff that I get there but it, it it's putting together a, a picture really of what the whole investigation and what this whole case is about um, one really cool cool investigation we did was in Oxford Connecticut um, I had given a lecture in Oxford and a woman came up to me afterward and she said oh we got a ghost on our security camera in our house do you want to see it? and I'm like sure I'll take a look and I'm thinking it's probably some orb that I just don't believe in orbs. I just, I'm not a, I'm not an orb believer. I just think they're usually bugs or dust or yeah. they're, yeah, I mean anything. They're, they're anything but a ghost. So I'm expecting that. And instead she shows me this picture, this, I'm sorry, video of a clip, really short clip of a, a girl standing there and she has her back to the camera and she turned, it's odd she steps back towards the camera like she's walking backwards and then she steps backwards again into a hallway so you never see her face but you see her hair you see what looks like a hand fly out and she's wearing a nightgown or a long dress um <clears throat> you know that investigation was really cool because that video is just incredible that's on my website you could watch that what's what's the url for the site um it's connecticutghosthunter.com okay and that's um, Ghost Girl Caught on Video, if you couldn't figure that one out by the, uh, by the title. Um, but, you know, through the investigation, and you're asking about, you know, how do you know and what do you, you know, how do you come to a conclusion? You do have to interview a lot of people. Sure. So I interviewed the mom, uh, the two daughters. Uh, Tom had, you know, had his, all of his uh, meters up. We had taken pictures and I had done some, you know, recording the whole time we were there. Um, and you piece together a whole history of this haunting. And in this case, the woman, when they were building the house, uh, the first time she saw this girl, she and her brother, uh, this is the woman, the homeowner, and her brother pulled up to the house and they were still building the house at the time. And they saw a little girl walk into the house and they figured it was the builder's daughter. Okay. So they walked in and they, you know, were walking around. They said there weren't even walls up yet. And they didn't see this girl. They were saying, where the hell did she go? Where, where's this girl? Um, the builder came in later and she, they said, Oh, we saw your daughter around here. He said, I don't have a daughter. And yours is the, yours is the only house here. There's one across the street that we built, but there's older boys that live there. There's no little girls in the neighborhood. Um, then the mom saw the little girl again. She was at her, uh, the, the mother was at the table filling out some forms. She felt somebody behind her. She thought it was one of her kids. And, uh, finally she turned around, saw this little girl standing there. Um, she screamed, the mother did not the girl. And, um, and she ran out of the room. Uh, the daughter saw the same little girl. Um, I got a recording of this little girl. That was really, really cool. Um, we were at the kitchen table interviewing her interviewing the family and the mom was telling a story about how this cat was almost 
whisked away by this hawk. It's like a side story. It had nothing to do with paranormal. And this little girl's voice says on the recorder, we didn't see her in this creepy little girl voice. Um, definitely wasn't the kids who were there. They were across the table. Right. Um, so, you know, you take all of this together, you know, when you do, like I said, you ask a lot of questions and then you look at the data and then you write it up like a case or like a story. So people get a sense of a beginning, middle, end, and, right. and your conclusions. And in that case, my conclusion was that there was something else on this property before. And sure enough, I went back to a map of 1828, I think it was, and found that there were houses on this property, um, you know, before this house was built. And that's where I thought this girl came from. So you do a lot of research beyond just interviewing people and listening back. You do look at history and uh, history of land and different things like that. So in a, in a way, it's like, you know, like dark matter and physics, you know, like you, you don't actually measure dark matter, but you can see how the, the, the physics that you can measure around that sort of reacts to it. Right. So right. in a lot of ways, like that's kind of what you're, you're, you're doing with this sort of investigation is mm-hmm. like you're seeing how the things that we can measure react to the things that are unseen that are, and there's like a, a, a concept of, of there's something being there or something being broadcast to yeah. your receptors and your brain somehow. Yeah, like, um, basically, like I was saying before, with uh, the data logging, um, when I'm really looking at it, it's it's like, hey, this shouldn't be here, or this should not be responding this way. Why is it doing that? Um, and the most interesting finds I found aren't the things in which I expect, but the things I say, huh, that's that's weird. <laughs> and then like investigate it, and it's can't really explain it. Um, <clears throat> but I have, uh, after working with uh, Barry for so long. When I first got into this, I was very, uh, I guess, uh, very, very, very scientifically minded, I guess, uh, trying to really just um, apply myself almost in a sterile manner Mm -hmm. um, to this environment. But it's really more of an organic experience, to be honest with you, Um, because you're talking with people and it's not just uh, crunching numbers and cold objectivity. Yeah. Yeah. uh, (laughs) I I do want to jump in because... uh, Tom and I had done an investigation in Ridgefield. I think that had turned things around for Tom Yeah. in a big way. Um, I was called because a woman's friend had committed suicide in this apartment above a barn. It's hard to describe. Um, it was a huge estate. And we were doing the EV, I'm sorry, the EVP, I almost said EMF, the EVP session um, on a staircase outside of this apartment because we couldn't get in because it was locked. And... Um, I was picking up, you know, information and, and I was asking the woman, you know, did she have this kind of car? And she was saying, yes, she had this. And that's when Tom really, I think that day started kind of going in a different direction, not just scientific, but he was picking up intuitive things that he will tell you about. (laughs) So yeah, before, before that day, there was, um, I definitely had experiences where uh, I, I would feel something or just something seemed off. Nothing, nothing like crazy, but you know, that feeling when you feel like somebody's in the room or somebody's like standing over you or something, it, it, stuff like that. But it, it was stuff I would brush off. This was not something I could brush off. Um, and for the, the longest time when I used to hear people saying uh, who were uh, sensitive, that they say like i'm seeing this i'm seeing that and i would say what the hell are you talking about you're seeing like are you seeing it in person or are you like imagining it um well this day i realized what they were actually all talking about uh, so i'm sitting there and what dawned on me afterward was that because i couldn't get in and because i couldn't do any type of uh, analysis of the uh, apartment i was basically sitting there bored i was just Okay, you know, maybe I'll think of a question or something or whatever. Sure. And I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and like, whatever. And all of a sudden I start seeing this silhouette of a woman uh, in my mind's eye, um, uh, which is basically that's the spot where like people will daydream or you dream. Right. It's like you, you generate that that image inside your head. I started seeing that in my mind's eye and I'm like, eh, okay, that's interesting. And then I tried to brush it off. Like, just like, let's go on to the next thought. Let's, you know, what am I going to have for dinner? I don't know. And it like locked in and it wouldn't go away. And it just became persistent, uh, almost like a child nagging, like mom, 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 mom. And I just got to the point where I'm like, okay, what the, what the F man? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so I, I kind of stopped everybody and I'm like, oh, hold on one second. And I, now keep in mind the, 
the investigation that we were doing, uh, the woman who was taking us on a tour knew uh, the woman who was um, believed to be haunting this apartment uh, in life. Um, I had never seen a picture of her. I don't know. Even in my mind's eye, I didn't know what she looked like. I only saw a silhouette. Um, but I turned to her and I said, uh, did she have like uh, brunette hair, kind of uh, curly or wavy, cut down to her shoulders? Um, and she said, no, it was actually longer like uh, down to her arms. But about two weeks before she died, she had uh, her hair cut to shoulder length. Which is essentially and the image. That's so. that's exactly what I was seeing. Yeah. And then I went, oh, my God, <laughs> what's huh. what's going on here? And that was actually a whole game changer for me because then it started to make me realize with the paranormal experience that I had had uh, in New Orleans about 10 years ago where I saw this girl just disappear who looked like a solid mass. I mean, she looked like she was there. Uh, I, I couldn't distinguish her from another person, basically, um, as like, oh, she, you know, she's um, partially invisible or something. No, it was like that was... <laughs> that was a girl until she disappeared. She was a girl right there. Uh, and then having this experience in my mind's eye um, brought me to basically a hypothesis, which uh, a lot of people will say theory. And I, I try my best to uh, apply science whenever I can. Mm-hmm. Um, there are no, uh, there are no long, longer any uh, laws in science that are created. They're all basically theories, um, which means a different thing in the scientific community than um, the general population. Um, so when you have an idea, uh, when you think something might be going on and you want to test it, you have a hypothesis. So I have a hypothesis now based on that, um, which is basically whatever's happening here is using, uh, I believe, uh, some frequency on, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, which is basically, uh, a whole field, <laughs> uh, a whole field of, uh, light being able to see light using microwaves, right. um, all of that is all on that spectrum. Um, so it's massive, it's big. Um, so I believe these things, whatever they are, are basically broadcasting almost directly into the brain uh, for 90% of these cases. Uh, I'm, I'm guesstimating something like that. Um, so it's, you might think you're seeing somebody actually standing there, when if you took a picture, like they wouldn't be there. Uh, kind of like if um, you were uh, watching TV and you try to take a picture beyond the television. Um, well, the signal's coming in and it's getting to the television and you're trying to take a picture beyond it. You can't, um, it's because it's not really there. Um, well, another important thing to mention too is that the concept of what we observe in reality is just a, a formulation or an illusion, if you will, that our eyes just being transducers take in this information and this mind's eye that we're talking about is actually what assembles our perception of reality yeah um it's i I like to say and i've heard it before from other people but it's um as people we're interpreting uh signals that are coming from our eyes from our ears from our skin that it's all being translated basically into an electrical current that's interpreted by the brain um so basically uh, we're all kind of hallucinating, but we're all having the same hallucination, if you will. So yeah. since we're all in agreement, physiology it, is making us see the same things. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you start having, and uh, I just want to make it clear, I'm not a medical doctor or anything like that. Um, but from what I've read, when you start having uh, situations where people may be mentally ill, um, they may be seeing things that aren't there. Um, in some cases, you might have uh, the brain is just misfiring. Um, and they're having a hallucination, but it's really how their brain is interpreting or uh, not interpreting the same way as everybody else. So like somebody who might be schizophrenic, um, and there was actually a study that was done where uh, a person who was having an episode of, uh, of hearing voices in their head, uh, some doctors did a brain scan on them, and what they found was that that person was actually hearing voices in their head but no sound was being generated outside in the environment. So in theory, it would be almost indistinguishable um, from somebody who was actually listening to somebody talk and doing a brain scan of them versus somebody who was having an episode. Um, so it really starts getting into this sort of uh, philosophical soup. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> like, when it starts getting real trippy, yeah. which is interesting. You know. Yeah, yeah I want to jump in and say... um. <clears throat> we had done an investigation in Tarrytown, which was a really, really cool investigation at a firehouse. The The TV show Ghost Adventures uh, contacted me because they saw my website and they said, you've got so much stuff. Do you know any place in Tarrytown? 
And long story short, somebody, you know, I put it out there on Facebook and somebody said, oh, the firehouse is haunted if you want to come and do an investigation. So I did the investigation uh, to try to see if it was worth the show doing the investigation and, and doing the show there. And it turned out to be such a cool thing. But I'm thinking as Tom was talking about sounds and seeing things and hearing things, the firemen in this um, firehouse were all hearing the same things. They were hearing uh, the door would open and they would hear footsteps running upstairs. Um, you know, they were all having the same, the same um, experiences at the same time. So, you know, that whole idea that it's working on your brain may be a big part of it, but it may not be the only part of it. There may be a real sound. Um, we may, you know, if I had a recorder there when they heard these footsteps running up, it may have picked it up because it may have been audible. You know, it may, and the door, they said that they've watched the door actually fly open. It's one of those hydraulic doors that really mm -hmm. doesn't fly open. Yeah. And it doesn't, certainly doesn't close shut. And it's also um, on a keypad that you need the code to get in. Right. Um, they've heard doors, you know, slamming, cabinets slamming. Um, one guy was pulled out of his chair. Um, I picked up some really good EVP when we were there, some good voices there. Um, but it's that, that common experience that you really look for in these type of investigations. Yeah, well, well that's what yeah. differentiates it from someone, like in the example of someone who's schizophrenic or whatever, having a, an isolated loan experience versus like, collective of people who are having the same exact you know visual experience in their visual cortex or they're hearing the same sort of voices right and at the same time you know I, I, Tom had talked about his his ghost that he saw the ghost that I saw I've only seen two believe it or not in all these years um, the one I saw was similar in that it was a little girl <clears throat> and I was at a house in Larchmont New York walking down this hallway and I was looking through my bag for my recorder at the time and I looked up and I saw this girl standing, uh, sit, I'm sorry, sitting on a little uh, stepping stool at the end of the hallway. And um, she just looked like a regular little girl with blonde hair, hands are in her laps and in her lap and she had uh, pigtails. And I just glanced up and looked at her and said, damn, there's a kid in the house. You know, I was kind of annoyed that she was there because I didn't want any kids there. And I looked up at the end of the hallway and she was gone. But it's uh, when I asked the family, they had seen that exact same girl. You know, they were able to say, yes, we've seen that girl looking at us through the bars of the upstairs hallway. Um, so those, again, I had a shared experience with the family who had, you know, own, you know owns that house. So that's another bit of evidence too. Yeah. Um, uh, just going back to the, uh, the firehouse uh, experience, the one thing that was... Um, it, it was really actually mind blowing when it happened. Was so Barry had picked up a few EVPs on, at at, um, at that location, and usually when we do that, first thing that he does is he'll call me up and say, "Hey, is this you?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I actually have to play it for my wife because the way in which I hear, like anybody else, when you hear uh, yourself played back, you don't sound the same way as when you actually hear yourself talking in real time. Yeah. Um, so. I actually, I, I had heard one EVP at one point that I'm like, oh, that that's me. And then I played it back uh, for my wife and she said, no, that's that's not you. And I'm like, that, that's how I sound though. And she's like, that's not how you sound. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I digress for a second. But uh, so he called me up and he said, hey, uh, is this you? I played it for my wife. I'm like, no. And I'm like, and that's, um, and I, I think I also... It, this EVP was actually talking over my voice, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, actually talking over one of the firemen. Oh, it was talking over the one of the yeah. firemen. That's what it was. Um, and so, and it, it wasn't Barry. Uh, I confirmed that. And so then after that, once we confirmed that this was not us, we then uh, go to whoever we did the investigation with and present it to them like, hey, is this any of you guys? Um, and it, I'm getting like chills down my spine thinking about it right now. Um, they all said, oh my God, that's this guy, uh, which was... Easy. Izzy, uh, Iggy, Izzy, Izzy, uh, Izzy, who was their, uh, fire captain, um, who they had believed was still there and kind of like running around uh, oh, wow. upstairs, okay. yeah. uh, but they were all like, no, that's, that's him. That's what he sounded like. And I'm like, oh my God. Huh. <laughs> and you know, to, to kind of add to that story, um, one of the things that they heard, all of the firemen heard, and we interviewed about, I think there were about five or six firemen there. It's really cool. Um, 
one thing that they all heard was this jingling, the jingling of keys. So they would hear somebody walking down a hallway from one end to the other and jingling keys, like on a big keychain. And it was Iggy. It was not Izzy. You're right. <laughs> you better memory than me. Um, and they said, oh, that's what Iggy used to do. He used to rattle his keys as he walked around. Oh, wow. um, so we get, not only got his voice, they all recognized his voice. Um, but, you know, it again corresponded to the other activity that was going on there. I just want to make it clear also that um, it wasn't like every EVP that we presented to them was like, oh, it's this guy or it's this guy. For the most part, they were like, yeah, we were not sure yeah. who that is. It's like an impulse. It, yeah, it's like, I, it could be anybody. But the fact that they were just like, no, this is Iggy. It was like, ah. <laughs> so one of the things that's I'm starting to see this picture of and this phenomenon being something that possibly one aspect of it, one face of this could be electrically based bypassing your ocular system and connecting directly to your quote unquote mind's eye you know or your your visual cortex to yeah. generating these this sort of imagery so now the million dollar question <laughs> so th any theories on where this uh this electricity this electrical impulses where this this sort of information is coming from if not from being generated internally um, uh, there are, like I said before, there are, uh, cases where uh, there are people who do have me uh, mental illness where it is being generated, uh, internally. Right. Uh, these cases are not that, um, and we do recommend if somebody is uh, having, uh, any type of physical or, uh, psychological issue to consult a, a doctor, um, yeah. and see what they say about that because neither one of us are medical professionals. Um, but it still begs the question of where... Where the hell is this stuff coming yeah, <laughs> from? Sure. Um, and I, I'm not 100 percent sure where it's being generated from, um, and where uh, what how it's actually happening. Uh, but what I am trying to do right now with my hypothesis is trying to see basically it, what in the human body can act basically like a receiver, like an antenna for a radio or uh, over-the-air broadcast for your television, something like that. Um, there's working models that show that like when you're driving in your car and you're listening to the radio, that's, that's a receiver yep. <laughs> that's, that's pumping that music into your car. Um, so in a similar model, it's, I believe there's something in the human body, uh, that acts like a, a dipole that will receive this frequency, um, to sort of, to generate these experiences. And I do believe that, um, uh, we may all have it, but the the length of the dipole may be different from person to person, which may mean why certain people are more sensitive to these things than other people. Why some people might see a little girl standing there and other people might not see a little girl standing there. It's kind of like, it'd be the equivalent of if Barry was on one radio station and I was on the other radio station and they were only broadcasting one one of those stations, I'd be hearing it, he wouldn't be hearing it or vice versa. Right, right. Um, so the, the key, I think, is to try to uh, figure out what in the human body can actually uh, receive this sort of transmission, if you will. Um, I mean, it could be like a, a, a unicellular organism, or it could be your optic nerve. I, you know, it's the scale is massive, um, but the electromagnetic spectrum is even more, even it's, more it's, massive it's, than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I was just thinking about. There's a whole subset, though, <clears throat> of of experiences that don't have to do with that. And I'm not saying that the the, um, the brain picking up those voices or visual things is that is one part of it. The other thing is the physical things that are happening in these hauntings. Yeah. Yeah, and that's totally different. Um, I had just done an investigation in where was I? In Connecticut. In, uh, I've done, I was in Connecticut somewhere. <laughs> um, Reading, Connecticut. Um, I can't say where I was. I do keep people's privacy and this particular sure. house yeah. belonged to a really famous person in history um and one thing two stories that they had that were incredible and i talked to the girl that it actually happened to um a girl was staying in in the room of the famous person when he had lived there he had this room um she was a i think 19 years old she, she wasn't a kid um, she woke up in the middle of the night. It was the summer. She was really hot. Um, she said she was just wearing like a t-shirt and, um, 
when she woke up in the morning, she was totally tucked into the bed with all of the covers tucked underneath the mattress all around her. She was like a little taco in that bed. Oh, wow. And um, it happened while she was asleep. Um, there was no explanation. She said, I just couldn't figure out what happened. Um, the same, the family that lives in the house currently were in one room and they watched a car, a toy car come from around behind a chair and roll all the way around the chair, kind of at an angle. I'm doing this with my hands as if you could see me, um, <laughs> coming around like in an arc and then straightening out and going straight across the room. It traveled about eight feet, I think it was. Um, and I had three different people talk about that. Um, I was at an investigation somewhere at some apartment somewhere that was really cool. Uh, you didn't ask the question yet. What was the scariest thing that ever happened oh, well, to you? No, we're getting to that. That's <laughs> where, like, you know, yeah. I know you want to wait to the yeah. end for that. And yeah. usually people ask me that at first. I'm like, well, no, where do I go from there? I find to be more, yeah. to me is like really interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm only telling the story cause it has a physical component to it. Um, but I was, it was in the first paranormal like, group I was in. And the woman said that her apartment was haunted and we're walking around and we're not feeling it. You know, we're like, it's a nice little sunny apartment. It just feels nice. I don't know what you're talking about. She's no, it's really haunted. Things fly off the shelves and all this stuff. So as we're in this, uh, one of the rooms, it was her bedroom. <clears throat> it got really creepy all of a sudden. You felt this thing kind of come in the room and we all felt it. And we said, oh, wow, do you feel that? And she said, that's it. That's what you feel. Then it went away and it came back and it was really strong. It was really oppressive feeling. It was like a sickness, like you felt sick, physically ill, and almost like in danger. And then it went out again. And the third time it came in, we were in the middle of the room and a um, there were a little stack of paper clips on a um, dresser across the room. And one of them shot across the room. We watched it and it hit one of us in the arm. And then this thing left. And it was one of the few times I've ever said, yeah, maybe I'll wait outside. <laughs> but I didn't. I, I was brave. Um, but, you know, those physical things that happen, um, it's a whole nother category. And it's that's really something that, you, you know, some of those things you can explain. If somebody says a book fell off of a shelf, it's like, eh, sometimes they do. Um, but some of those other things you do have to really take notice of yeah when it seems like a directed sort of activity like that right for sure you know there's yeah you know. and a lot of times it's a spirit trying to get your attention saying hey i'm here i'm gonna move this thing i'm gonna move this car or you know flick you with this <laughs> with this paper clip well what, what grabbed my attention about the you know sort of the visual aspect of it is like uh, and anyone out there that's listening probably understands i've talked about this before is like in in ceremonial magic like when you med, you know, a big component of it is meditation, different rituals, and you go into this meditative sort of state, and a lot of it is visualization. And some of people, some people who practice ceremonial magic, will see entities in the same angels or demons or whatever, you know, hopefully angels, <laughs> and call on them to help them or give them guidance, things like that. So. What, what comes to mind with discussing this sort of stuff is is that sort of connection between like sort of bypassing your transducers, meaning your skin, your eyes, your nose, yeah. and connecting directly into Go the straight to the eye. source. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and the whole other sort of horizon of things that might be trying to communicate with you through that sort of method, you know. And that's, you know, spirits like whatever you know and a lot of it it's like like we were talking about that film uh the fourth kind yeah, where yeah. our our brains like our human experience has to assign things that we're comfortable with to these things that might exist beyond our sort of like uh you know imagination yeah so by using these kind of like human abstractions to assign things that are incomprehensible to ourselves is like maybe like a way of like making it more of a subjective experience yeah, and it's um, usually when I'm, uh, me specifically, when I'm talking about something that may be like a poltergeist or a demon or something yeah. like that, um, I'm typically using sort of um, the terminology of the lore, if you will, yeah. um, to be able to explain what what's happening. Um, do I believe that there's a heaven and a hell or like a God and a devil? And I honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. Sure. <laughs> um, but I don't. I don't think that, you know, 
there are entities that are coming up from hell per se. Um, but you do notice that there are different uh, characteristics of different types of hauntings and people have already put names on these things. So it becomes easier to identify what's actually occurring. Um, like one of the, the biggest challenges that Barry and I had uh, talked about was determining the difference between a poltergeist and a demon. Yeah. Um, it's not actually that easy, <laughs> believe okay. it or not. Um, Oh. Uh, um, <laughs> but, but basically like the way I, I sort of try and approach it is um, almost like an epidemiologist, somebody who studies uh, viruses, mm -hmm. uh, a, a doctor who studies viruses. Um, you know, before we even knew what bacteria and viruses were, people were aware that things were, were going on. People would be quarantined if they were sick, but they weren't exactly sure why they were sick. Yeah, there could um, have been a curse put yeah, on them or something. It, it could have knows? been the devil himself that yeah. came up and, you know, made you sick um we've, we've since learned from that and i kind of feel like uh for myself and people who are taking the angle that that i'm at right now it's it's sort of pre-discovery of bacteria and viruses for paranormal things that are occurring that there is something that's going on what that is i uh, i have no idea to be honest yeah. so uh, barry wants to say something well tom brought up the d word the the demon word um i've done two demon cases two and a half uh, two, you know, where I was actually there and one where somebody contacted me and I was actually able to help her without going. Uh, I was able to get rid of her demon, which is pretty cool. Yeah, go me. Um, and those cases, I mean, a demon is, uh, it, it is a totally different thing than a haunting and it's a totally, it, it, it's, it's similar to a poltergeist. There's similar activity up to a point. All right, so let me jump in real quick. So define poltergeist for anyone who's uh, familiar. With well, you know, quick, six million dollar yeah. answer. <laughs> you had to look watch yeah. the movie. I mean, I, a lot of um, a lot of people listening would probably watch the movie. But, yeah. uh, poltergeist is, is a German word that translates as noisy ghost. Uh, a lot of people know that, and and it's because things are flying around. There's a lot of physical activity with with poltergeist uh, cases. Um, Dishes are flying off of shelves. Things are happening in the full view of other, you know, people, um, not just one person. It usually it revolves around a, an adolescent child, <clears throat> and a lot of times, once that child grows up, it just goes away. Um, there is a lot of physical activity, and it kind of does resemble um, demonic cases. But the the difference in a demonic case is a demon is a spirit who is never on earth they were never alive this is something that was you know never here and their goal is to wear down a person's will until they could possess them um those cases the stories that those people tell are just so insanely crazy mm -hmm. um and yet you you interview the people and you're there with them and you're like these people are not crazy uh one case that i did in kent it was a husband wife kent, and new york and no, um kent connecticut oh, okay all right um that's like literally the next town to over i grew up in oh really <laughs> yeah like... the, the whole state of connecticut is <laughs> yes, yeah. just don't don't go to connecticut. that's why i'm there that's why i live there um <laughs> uh, this husband wife and they had a couple kids um it started out that case started out as this this experience that they thought they were having a religious experience they were in bed one night it was you know dark <clears throat> they're in the middle of the woods there and they were just talking and they start to see these lights on the wall and they were like little lights you know kind of flitting around the room and they're looking back at the window saying you know where's that coming from and then all of a sudden they kind of explode into these stars and this is where the husband and wife are talking back and forth and the husband's like, you tell him about that, you know, there were stars and like butterflies. She's like, yeah, yeah, like butterflies flying around the room. Then all of a sudden this black smoke poured out of the wall and the woman's um, deceased father walked into the room and she had this long conversation with him and they thought, wow, you know, I just had this, this experience and it was so beautiful and visual and my dad was there. Um, he made another appearance a couple times and then finally he made an appearance in the living room and she was there and she sees him and he's standing there holding a smoking cigarette and holding a drink. And she said, this is not like him. And mm -hmm. he said something like, you know, you better watch your son. And he walked over and put his hand on her, on the boy's head. And the woman started crying to me. Sure. And she said, I saw my son being dragged down to hell. Oh. And after that, there were crazy things. I mean, the stories of demon cases, uh, they watch two hooded figures, black, just black shapes with hoods, walk up the stairs. And the husband tells me, he said, out of the ground came this huge snake 
that went up in the air and swallowed both of these things and then disappeared into the ground. And they saw these little nymphs climbing up the curtains. Now they're both seeing the same things. Yeah, it's they're, the same they're sort seeing, of imagery. They're, they're, and you know, again, there's no way for me to prove that these people are insane, but they're they're having a shared hallucination if they are. And as you interview them, and they're finishing each other's sentences, you're just like, there's something to this. They're not just making this up and like, you tell your story, and then I'll tell what I saw. Right. You know, they're they're telling me what they both saw. Um, those cases, I tend to I tend to take a more traditional look at demon cases. I think they're demonic, you know, from from hell, from the devil, and you know, not everybody has that feeling, but I do. Um, the woman that I was ha- helped in Enfield um, had told me all about her demon, and also demon cases ramp up. They start out very simple, and they seem like regular hauntings, and they get worse and worse. Hers started out with lights being turned on, to uh, seeing flashing lights in the hallway. Um, she had a, an amazing story. She put all of her daughter's clothes in the closet one night after she washed them and folded them. She put them in there. The next day, they were all gone. She never found them. Wow. Never, okay. ever found them. She said, uh, it was like, but not a little bit, like 10 pairs of pants and it's not just 20 shirts. Sock no, no. It appears in the laundry. <laughs> and I, like you know, I, I said, you know, you didn't go out and come back. She said, no, I put them there, went to sleep, woke up. They were gone. And they never came back. Uh, it finally ended where she went out in the hall. It started up again. And she said, oh, I thought you were gone because she had someone come and do a blessing of the house. And it did stop for a while. <clears throat> and then she said she heard this growl. She said it sounded as loud as a lion right in her face growling at her. Um, demonic cases are really, they are crazy. They're scary. Yeah. You know, and people call me, you know, I'm not a demonologist, but I will give people help. And with this woman, I was able to send her some holy cards and things that I had blessed. And I said, put these in the closet where a lot of the stuff is going on. Um, she had this cool story. Can I tell one more story about yeah, this team in case? Because yeah, it's, so, it's such cool stuff. Um, scary as it is. She said it was her birthday and um, she had this Mylar balloon that said happy birthday in her bedroom. And she said she watched it one night go back and forth. It would go from one side of the room, like somebody walked it over, it would turn and then it would walk back the other way. And she said she watched it go back and forth until it finally went in the closet. She said it went on for like 10 minutes. Then she said she sleeps with a fan on her, you know, right in her face. Mm-hmm. She woke up the next morning and the balloon was between her face and the fan. It wasn't being blown. Like someone was like holding it in place. Hold it in place, she says, impossible. And she said my, my face was like, you know, four feet from the fan. So this thing was between my face and the fan just sitting there. Um, she popped the balloon and yeah that was <laughs> the first thing i would do too yeah um but demon cases are something else i don't take those cases i was kind of the fooled into the first one they, they didn't tell me till i got over there and they said yeah. well, well this is really what's happening um another one i did in woodstock new york um, with two sisters that had a demon attacking both of them um they had you know same stories they knew what they were seeing um and that other case so just want to jump in about demons because yeah. it seems like you'd have to have like some sort of like specialized like <laughs> like very deep understanding of, you do yeah yeah there's there's prayers and rituals and you had mentioned rituals before those yeah. are important um for whatever reason and they do work you know my prayer worked to get rid of the the demon in enfield it went totally away when she put that stuff in her closet called her up and she said it's gone they were seeing other things in the house but everything was gone after that now, one of the things, you know, in nature, things never exist in just one. You know what I mean? There's always two or more in the, in the natural world. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson, actually, do you believe, mentioned something along these lines, that there actually are more than one reality? Like, there's different planes of existence or different, and that's where some of these, like, electromagnetic emanations are coming from, or that there's, like, a blurring of the lines. Because, like, you mentioned, like, you know, broadcast and like radio stations, and you know, sometimes when you're you're traveling through, you're cro- you're on 84, you know, and you're going towards Danbury, you know, and then <laughs> one radio station clicks out and another one comes in. Like you might be getting, uh, you know, was it I 95 FM or something like that, and then oh, yeah, you you'll you'll suddenly change channels. Like, do you think something like this could happen? And some of this is like some of this paranormal stuff that's going on. Um, it's it's entirely possible that. It's, it's almost like, 
another plane of existence that's almost like kissing ours, if you will. Um, that, uh, yeah, there are definitely other realities that that do exist. Um, I mean, even going back to the whole uh, us interpreting uh, from our eyes, ears, skin, and all that stuff. Um, your life experience is a different life experience than mine, even though we're in the same room in the same environment. It, in, in and of itself, it's it's, yeah. it's a whole different. Just to get people to mm-hmm. to agree on what they actually saw, like yeah, two witnesses or three or four different people like, describing one event. Yeah, and, you know, the, so, the accounts vary drastically. And and I mean, uh, I know that uh, the question was pertaining a little bit more towards like multi-dimensional things. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, even just within our own dimension, <laughs> it's sure. it's alternate realities that actually exist between us. Uh, they're just close enough together that we happen to agree on enough of it. But I, I do think that it's entirely possible that this, uh, if you want to call it a broadcast or whatever, is possibly coming from a different plane of existence. But once you start getting into quantum mechanics, to be honest with you, I, I know some people may try and like throw it out there and say it's, it's this and that. I've tried to jump into quantum mechanics, and man, I'll be honest, my brain melted out the side of my head. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's very very complicated, and it's it's not so much like up is down and um, down is up. It's up is left and left is forward. <laughs> it's like wait what? So I once you start getting into that, I kind of back out. Um, I, yeah, but just on like a maybe an instinctual feeling. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I just want to add about um, kind of a theory and or or something that I have based on an investigation I did in White Plains. Um, the, the family there, uh, there was an older woman and she was sitting in her living room and she looked down the hallway and she saw this old man in the study. Um, the house, I could remember the house. There was a living room, there was a little area in the middle, there was another room and then the study was at the end. And she could see him clearly. She said he had a white shirt, light color pants, a belt. She could see everything about him. And he seemed to be looking around the room like it was his room. He's looking out the window as if he was waiting for someone. And then he looked in the living room and he saw her and he like kind of like got shocked like, oh my God, there's somebody in the living room. And and he disappeared. Um, in the same house upstairs, the, the father, there was the older woman, then there was an older man, had seen a similar vision or a similar ghost of a, of a younger man wearing a suit, looking out of their window, kind of looking, waiting for somebody. And he too turned around and kind of noticed this old couple laying in bed and they, he kind of jumped and disappeared. And I'm like, well, you know, that's really weird. Why would a ghost be startled by you? And I wondered if, you know, 50 years ago, a guy was in his study, an old man was in his study and he looked out in his living room and he saw this woman sitting in his living room and he jumped and she disappeared and she was from the future and he was just seeing a little piece of the future yeah. as was the guy in the bedroom so it doesn't necessarily mean it's a different dimension i mean it could be time could be another dimension um but that could that's a whole nother explanation for some of the things that we see um, well, there there is a theory that time isn't actually sequential that it actually exists like just in like this continuum Oh yeah, 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 and yeah. And I, I actually use that example when I say that, that that's the reason why you can pick up information, intuitive information, because time is not linear. Um, you're you're kind of um, remembering something that already happened, you know, yeah. even though it happened in the future, right? You yeah. know, uh, because it's not linear. Uh, oh, what's that? Uh, oh, damn, there's that author. His whole thing is about that Legati. Um, the first season of True Detective steals from this dude, and I can't remember. It's um anyway. I'll have to I'll have to put this in the show notes or something about it. But yeah, <laughs> there's a guy who writes about all this stuff very very eloquently. Yeah, there, uh, it's it's something for me that doesn't make sense about time. That our interpretation of it seems almost archaic, if you will, mm-hmm. um, because it is something that's linear from our observation, um, and. Yeah, theoretically, you can uh, move into the future by uh, the closer you get to the speed of light. If you move, uh, everything around you slows down. But the thing is, is that even if you're moving close to the speed of light, you observe yourself moving in real time. Like there's there's nothing that you can do yeah. <laughs> uh, other than, I don't know, going to a coma or something. You uh, can't the, win. Yeah, you, you basically, you can't, you can't win. Like you're, it's almost like you're a prisoner on this linear path. Um, or you could look at it on a more positive way instead of saying a prisoner, like you're on a guided path, if you will, that you can't uh, break free of. 
Um, well, I mean, like the, you know, I want to show my, my background a little bit here is like the study of uh, dynamics and kinematics, like mm -hmm. in, in mechanical engineering. It's, uh, you know, everything is with relationship to another. There's always a reference point. Like if you're describing like the trajectory yeah. of a particle through space, like that trajectory is based on some reference point as zero. Yeah. Now that zero could be another position in time space to some other reference point. So there really is, it's arbitrary whether or not what zero is or what yeah. a day is or what it's 60, 60 seconds is, is all pretty much arbitrary depending on what your perspective is. Yeah. I just, it's, um, I just feel like there's more to time than what we can actually observe. Yeah. Um, like we're, there was an analogy that I had heard once where um, it was almost like uh, to understand how other uh, people interpret things. It, um, the model was it was a, a two dimensional um, society, basically. So they were basically all flat, but they lived in the second dimension. And the question was, if a sphere goes through their dimension, not hurting anybody, but just goes through their dimension, what would it look like? Um, would it look like a circle? Would it look like a sphere? And the the way that they would probably interpret it, which was thought of was basically it would be a line that would get wider and wider and wider and then smaller and smaller and smaller and disappear. So they wouldn't be actually seeing a sphere. They would just see a line that would grow and shrink. Um, so I kind of think of our interpretation of time as something like that. Yeah, no, I totally <laughs> that, agree with that. That we're, we're not seeing the whole picture. So. Yeah, I remember studying all this stuff in college and thinking the same thing that what, you know, it, that, that one class I took in that particular subject kind of like changed the way I saw time and space and everything. And it was like probably one of the only things that out of that whole, you know, course of study that really impacted me at all yeah. was just thinking about time and space and r relationships between different things and how they are very arbitrary. Yeah. So any more scary cases, like anything that meaningful or <laughs> anything that jumps out, terrifying that jumps out at you? <laughs> the worst, the worst, scariest. Um, they're all so interesting. I mean, they're just really interesting. And um, there's just tons of them. Um, the things that jump out at me, though, are the the things that I felt um, and, and some of the EVP that I've picked up. I did an investigation in Ridgefield, Connecticut. There's Connecticut again, that haunted <laughs> place, um, where, again, I didn't want to know anything about what was going on there. But um, walk through and I said, wow, it's really strong in this room. I feel something in this room, in the hallway and in the bathroom across. And the family said, oh, that's where we've seen this old man. Um, we sit in the living room. We see, we've watched him walk back and forth between those rooms. Like some a guy with a bladder problem. Some old man who just used the, <laughs> used the bathroom a lot. Um, and I got maybe the best EVP ever in that room. Um, and it was a funny one, and it's really clear and funny. Um, I'm in there with one of the other investigators, and we're whispering really quietly. And you hear this old man. Now, I didn't know this. this I didn't even know at the old time at the time that there was an old man uh, involved in this room. And he says, "Oh my gosh, a Buick!" <laughs> like he looked out the window and saw a Buick, and like he was a car enthusiast. And he's like, "Oh my gosh, a Buick! Look at that." Uh, we didn't have a Buick out there. Um, but things like that, where you get these amazing voices or you feel something, um, <clears throat> you hear people's stories and they're all talking about the same stories. I, there's just so many stories. I mean, uh, those are the ones that, that, that stick with me, though. So now, where could people find out more information about what you guys do? Uh, you know, we would mentioned the website. Um, you know, what, what kind of stuff can they find on the website? Uh, the website is action-packed. <laughs> I've had about three different paranormal TV shows. I know I mentioned Ghost Adventures. There was, I can't even remember the names of these things. Paranormal Survivor contacted me, and I think My Ghost Story, or one of those shows. Because um, I've got so many case files. Those are really interesting. If you want to read real like ghost stories of cases that I've done and I've done with Tom, um, those, that's one thing that's there. There's tons of EVP, really good ones to listen to. I also have a monthly newsletter. Um, you had mentioned before about, uh, rituals and putting yourself into a state. Mm -hmm. And my newest uh, newsletter is about something called a psychomantium. Have you ever heard of a psychomantium? I, I have, yes. Yeah. And, um, those of you who haven't, it's a mirrored booth. It's a booth, a booth that's dark with a mirror in it. And you sit there and, and you see 
not only people in the mirror that are totally realistic and lifelike, but they come out of the mirror and they talk to you and these are deceased loved ones. Um, they really echo with stories that people have had about seeing de deceased loved ones, you know, uh, in other instances where they look younger and they say that they're fine. Um, so I've got the newsletter on there, uh, case files, EVP, uh, talking about where I'm doing, you know, my lectures and I do a bunch of those every year. Um, and probably other things that I just don't even remember what's on that website. I've got tons of stuff on there. And that, that's your uh, prime uh, point of contact if anyone wanted to get in touch with you? Yeah, website? that's pretty much where most people contact me is through the website. And again, it's ConnecticutGhostHunter.com. One ghost hunter like I'm it. <laughs> Not ghost hunters, plural. Well, guys, thanks for uh, spending some time with us. And I appreciate everything. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, Mike. You've been very it. generous thank with you. your time. Very generous with your time. Thank you. And thanks for listening. And that's it for the first episode of Night Talk. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you guys later.